Okay, welcome back after the break. Uh, we just looked at chapter two. Uh, we'll continue with chapter three. If uh, anyone has any more questions, any more questions? Yes, Francis, can please yeah, give the mic to Francis? I don't know, it's not even the Bible. What's the name of Sammy's Bible? No, I don't think it's mentioned in the Bible. <laughs> yes. Uh, like he's a uh, like his God will uh, is okay to for broken marriages. It's God's. Is it God's will for broken marriages? Because like uh, I have uh, heard and seen of people who are in ministry, but still uh, their marriage are uh, broken up. What do you think? Is uh, is it God's will for broken marriages? No ways. But like, why come uh, God? Like, why come? We can't it uh, attribute everything that happens to God. Some of sometimes it's our own choice that we make. We make the wrong choice, and we can't attribute it to God, right? So sometimes uh, we see that okay, this is a good person. The person is rich. Must my person is earning well, well qualified. I'm in ministry. The person can be son, but. You know, then the person who's coming and is worldly and not able to get into the ministry mode or have that heart for God. And so there is. Uh, but when uh, two persons were in ministry, like I know about uh, one uh, minister, uh, she is a songwriter, she is a singer, and and uh, her husband is also in ministry. They ministry in same uh, foundation, but still they got, got married and then they broke up. Yeah, the many, many people who are in ministry, uh, that's what being in ministry doesn't make us automatically angels, doesn't mean everything is going to be perfect, we are still going to be human, we are, we are more in the, in the forefront of the battle, where we need to guard ourselves, guard our lives, our ministry, our personal lives, and that is why we're studying this book, giving importance for that. Yes, good questions, thank you. Yes, Anand. When coming to the ministry, uh, you have told about the priorities that man and woman, right? I don't know, can I ask this question or not? I, I... It's okay. No problem. You ask it. People used to uh, tell like uh, women can't, women uh, can't preach, don't preach uh, in full preach and the things. There are some, some priorities to man and woman that God has given. And in the same way that uh, we we see Hizras in uh, ministries also, right? Hizras, Hizras. Huh? Ezra. 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 No, Ezra not. Ezra. Ezra, you mean Ezra, the scribe? Oh, transgenders, okay. Yeah, transgenders. So, so people, I saw so many uh, big, big pastors telling like, uh, transgenders uh, uh, don't do ministry and preach. So they are they are not the persons who who is in position to preach. So uh, can they also preach word of God, being as a pastor? What do you think, transgenders? Did God make transgenders? Did God create transgenders? I only know He created Adam and Eve. He did not. He did not create. He created Adam. To be like Adam, Adam race, we, he created Eve and the Eve race. He did not create. Um, he did not create somebody to be a blend of both, right? Somebody to move to the sun. So he did not create transgenders. It's just uh, the Bible says that it's just the, uh, you know, uh, that is a lie of the enemy that they have believed, and that's not the truth. Uh, so can they preach? I don't think uh, they should preach because they're basically living a, a lifestyle that is a lie. So what truth they can preach? One How they can preach? Uh, one person that I know, uh, yeah, he, uh, the person who got uh, transgender, so he got baptized and, and came to know that Jesus Christ. 
and uh, so after that uh, he started a ministry also in between the transgenders uh, to preach the word then it's okay because he's he was somebody who was living that lifestyle but then he uh, he repented of his sins he's baptized and then he can go back and yeah he can minister up that why not when he's living his true identity of who he is in christ and what god who god has created him to be then he can go and minister yes yeah, he set himself right with christ that's is right. it okay some yes. some professors are comparing the lives before the transgender and after the transgender that they can't preach the word of god no no anyone who is anyone who is uh, in christ they are called a royal priesthood they are ministers of god yes and can women please you said can women preach and teach oh this okay okay Shiv Kumar says, I think they can. Who do you think can, Shiv Kumar? Can you just qualify your statement? No, I need to make sure that's what. Shiv Kumar, who can teach? He says, I, I think they can. So who's a day? Can you qualify, please? Yes. Ah. Uh, it's a question about life partner, man. Question about life partner. Life partner. Yeah. Like uh, I saw many pastors, they used to say like particular one person for one girl or one boy. So is this like uh, God create only one person for one boy or God create boy and girl? It's my choice to choose someone, choose someone for me. Are you getting my question, right? Yes. God created uh, from heaven me, right? And the same time for my partner. Only one partner is there or it's my choice to choose my partner. Same way, like God has a specific plan and purpose for your life, He's going to show you which career, which field you want to join, which job, all of those things. The same way, He has someone uh, for you, and uh, yes, He will. If you are you're asking Him, He will show you. He will guide you. To the Actually, life. like that's my choice, right? Whom I'll get married. Yes, and your choice will be in if you are your will is aligned to God's will, then you will also align. It's a good question. It's a very important question. You will also align your will to God's will in the area of marriage as well. Yeah. And you will know from the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, your conscience, where God is leading you. Yes, this is the right person. And God will also show you through the inner witness of the Holy Spirit that peace, everything goes well. This is the right person. Yeah, because I'm asking this question because there's many people die before, like when they are kids, right? Many boys or guys die. So if God created a particular one person from, for them, it's not like that. No, it's not. Yeah, like that. That, that my question is. No, no, it's not. Like that. Oh, transgenders who accept Christ, yes, yes. Thank you, Shiv Kumar. Uh, Nina says, uh, Nina says, within what God has instituted for a proper functioning for home, it is also the role of the husband to love Christ, to love like Christ's love. In which case, submitting is not a burden. The word also says submit to one another. Yes, Nina's question. Submit to out of reverence for Christ. We submit because uh, we're submitting to Christ, just like uh, she's saying. Yes. Thank you, Nina John, for adding that. Yes. Next, she has a mic. Then pass it on to Sean, please. Okay, quick, quick, quick. Pass it on. Sean, come here. Sean, because the mic is here, you can quickly come. Uh, Ma'am, just like, um, like I want to ask, like, what if um, I, I've seen like uh, some uh, gay people have become like um, uh, priests or like pastors and all that. Which people? The gay people. Homosexuals. Yeah. Okay. So you mean a gay? Yeah. Okay. So uh, what do you make of that? I mean, they, they, uh, God has strictly said in the Bible that you know, it's a, no man is supposed to love another man or a woman another woman, but they, they now they are becoming pastors. Like, uh, what does that mean? It means that uh, you know how uh, uh, you know how perverted they are becoming in their in the word of God, and um, what does um, uh, you know um, Paul write in Romans chapter one? He says, "God says, you know, I will give them up. I will let them go their own ways. Their choice. I will let them go to their own choice. That's why their minds are perverted. You know, this is talking about the perversion of the mind. So the minds are perverted because." You know they are um, they are not uh, worshiping me. They are worshiping created things. 
um, even though I have made uh, you know myself visible through nature, the invisible attributes of God, the eternal power of God, His deity is made visible in creation. But God says, is irrespective of that, and even they have their conscience, you know, they they're making their own choices. And God says, I will I will give them up. I will let them go their own ways. to their, to give up what their perverted minds are. So God does not treat, treat us like puppets on strings, you know. He gives us our own gift of volition and choice. So, so what do I make of it? It's just so sad. We just have to pray for them that God will open their eyes to see the truth. Yes. You have a question? We posted. So ma'am is... Uh, marriage is also predestined by God? Oh, no, no, nothing is predestined by God. Uh, predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his image and son. Uh, we are predestined to be conformed to his glory. But God does not predestine our choices that we are going to make. He knows the choices. He foreknows the choices that we are going to make. But he pre does not predestine. If you say God predestines our choices, that means we are saying he's a partial God. He predestines some to go to heaven, some to go to hell. He's not a partial God. He um, he knows, foreknows the choices that we are going to make, but he does not predestine our choices. Uh, the choice is ours, but does he know? He does know. Uh, but... What is a predestination? He predestines us to be conformed to the image of his likeness of his son, predestined to be conformed to his glory, okay, predestined to be like him, uh, to be his, all that, after we know him as God and Savior. So he does not predestine who we are going to marry, but he knows who will marry, what the choices will make. Yeah, he knows who we are going to marry. He, he knows somebody who can, uh, you know, son. but that person can say, I don't want to marry you. See, yes. so that, that's their own choice. That person's own choice. That doesn't mean that God is going to run out of choices. He will lead us to another person. Yes. Rin. Um, Pastor, I've heard of... Um other pastors, um, like God revealing to them whom, uh, like in a congregation, <laughs> like um, like a person should marry that person, they both are supposed to be together. And so is it, I mean, the pastor says that God told me, but to the people, the believers, it, it's something that... Um, yeah, that sometimes they we've heard that, you know, pastor saying that okay, God told me you both have to get married. <clears throat> what did we learn about when we hear godly counsel? Um, everything that we said, all of those, you know, guideposts, those lists that we talked about, excepting for the word of God, we have to validate everything by going back to scripture, right? Uh, in receiving God's guidance, remember those nine things that we, eight things, I think, seven or eight things, you know, stirring within, uh, receiving counsel, knowing within, all of that has to be validated with scripture. So the pastor says, uh, God is telling me you both need to get married, then you both go and pray and ask God. If God has revealed it to the pastor, he will reveal it uh, to you as well. But just don't do it because the pastor says, but you need to pray and hear from God as well. So sometimes a pastor can hear wrong. Sometimes it can be even pastors are just doing it to manipulate people, uh, to keep the sheep within their own, you know, all the manipulative techniques that some of the pastors use to just keep the sheep within them, to have control over them, to exercise their lordship. We look at it. Okay. But if the pastor says very genuinely, you pray, and if it's God's will, you know, he will guide both of you uh, and give you the peace. Yes, Sean. Uh, sorry, uh, no uh, ma'am. Like uh, God has, everyone has. Uh, God has made a set plan for everyone, right? Now, suppose if a particular person like deviates from the plan, and does God's plan change accordingly, or is that also part of God's plan that he might deviate and then come back again? Like, what do you think from all that we learned in this last yeah. uh, August, September, October? You answer me that question. Yeah, ma'am. 
Go ano? <laughs> so God has a plan for you, and you go away from God's plan. You think God changes His plan to adjust to your plans? No. Okay. Thank God. Yes, He does not adjust. His plans still hold. Okay. Does He wait for you to come back? Does He uh, stir you up to come back? Yes. When you come back, does He take you back and on the line for your path and plans and purposes? Yes. So you answered your question. Thank you. Yes. One last question. Give him the mic, please. I think the class is waking up. Good. I think that is also just like God reveals his plan and purpose to your life, he will reveal this as well to you. Yes. So you just need to ask, pray, and wait on God, and he will reveal. Yes. Any more questions? Yes, Francis? What's Francis' question? How, what, what? How do you know your spouse before marriage? You pray and ask God and ask you to show you. God will show you. Yes, there are some people who I know that, you know, God has told them specifically, this is where you're going to meet your spouse. This is how he's going to look at, like, and it has happened exactly. God is interested in our lives, in every little thing. Yes, Sean? Sorry? The inner? Inner witness of the Holy Spirit? Yes. Why not? All of you are very excited about marriage. <laughs> okay. They must just be praying because you're a young person and they might just generally be play, praying. But if you just want a, a confirmation, you can ask it from God and, you know, you can ask God to, to give you like a word of prophecy, show you specific. Yes. Yes, Sean? Yeah, why not? You can meet your life partner in your 50 or 60 as well. If you are going to delay things, things will get delayed for you. Yeah. But delays from God are not denials, but we know delays comes not because of God, but because of us. So, yes. Francis. Hmm. Quick, quick, quick. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, his Francis question is, God has a spouse for me and I don't want to marry her. What will she do? You don't have to worry because God will bring a better spouse for her. So God has many spouses for her, a better one who, uh, who will God will bring. Okay. So good. He's worried about the spouse. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's move on. Any more questions? Okay, we move on to um, lesson three. Okay, now Christian ministry, sadly, people think it's about an organization, it's about a church, it's about a big church, events, programs, uh, mission trips, uh, writing books, producing songs, um, you know, building buildings, planting more churches. Uh, well, all of this is part of Christian ministry, but basically, Christian ministry is all about people okay christian ministry is all about people it's about ministering to people it's about reaching out to people it's about touching lives with god's love his power 
uh, to rescuing them from the hold of Satan, bringing them into God's marvelous light, uh, you know, nurturing them into Christ likeness, and uh, you know, uh, seeing them be released into the full destiny, plan, and purpose that God has for their lives. And in that process, you know, we include all of these things, you know, worship, songwriting, books, um, you know, building buildings, um, you know, doing various uh, events, organized, uh, uh, you know, crusades and all of that is basically to build people. It's not just to build our business or our ministry. Okay. So ministry is basically about people is having them encounter Jesus Christ, seeing their lives transformed. Uh, into the image of Jesus Christ. Okay, so even as ministry is all about people, we also know that people are the biggest challenge, right? Uh, ministering to people, dealing with people, working with people is not easy. It's going to be very, very difficult. You know, we need to understand how to treat people well, how to lead them, how to manage people, how to correct them, how to equip them, empower them, and release them into their um, destiny. So this is something that we need to learn because people are important. Uh, and also ministering to people is the biggest challenge because people can be uh, difficult. Okay, uh, we'll just look at a few uh, lessons that we can learn from the life of Paul. You know, in First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, Paul says, tells the people, you are God's field, you are God's building. So who is this you? He's referring to the believers, the church at Corinth. So he's telling them, you know, the, the people are God's field, the people are God's building. Um, so, uh, you know, ministry is all about serving people and it's all about building people. We need to get that um, right. Okay. Um, you know, and we're here to lift people up. We see here to transform them into the likeness of Jesus Christ, uh, get them to see their divine destiny, their calling and their um, purpose. Another thing we can look from, learn from uh, Paul's life in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, uh, Paul says, you are our epistle written in our hearts. So where are people written? You know, in Paul's hearts. That means he valued people. He treasured them. He, they were his prized possession. Okay. And it's important uh, to value people. It's important to have people in our hearts. When we have people in our hearts, that's when we will not look for fame and for um, for uh, money and for uh, power and to misuse people, uh, you know, uh, to have uh, to boss over them because we are looking at people as somebody who are, are you know, who are valuable to us, our prized possession. We are here to serve them. We are here to give into their lives. We are here to speak over their lives. So everything that you do, uh, you will have a heart for people. You will reach out to people. You will invest into their um Lives. Another thing we can learn of what Paul uh, writes is in First Thessalonians chapter two, verses nineteen and twenty. He says, "You know, when he stands before God, what is his joy, his hope, and his reward?" He says, "You, you people who I have served, who I ministered, who I brought to the uh, Lord." So he's saying it's not the mission trips I went, the number of churches I established, the number of. Uh, uh, leaders I trained, the number of young people I've trained, the number of churches that I've established, the number of epistles that I have written. No, it is you. You are our hope, our joy, our crown, our reward. When we stand before God, it's you that we are going to be uh, boasting about. So when you write people in our hearts, that's when God gives us the freedom, the power, and the liberty to speak into their hearts. See, if we are here as ministers to make use of people, I want to be nice to all these people. I want to speak nicely to them. I want to preach sermons that they want to listen to, uh, make them feel good so that they don't go up to some other churches, so that they give me more money, they give all their tithes, they give all their son, you know, so that I can have a good lifestyle. Then we are actually misusing people. We're not, then God does not give us the freedom and the liberty to write into their hearts. And such churches are churches where, uh, you know, they, we don't see the move of God, we don't see the life of God, we don't see people's lives being transformed. But when we write people in our hearts, it's also we see the Holy Spirit begins to transform work and move in a mighty uh, 
way. Okay. So when we're ministering to people, we need to realize that if people are in different stages of their Christian growth. Okay. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. Um, <clears throat> and he says, you know, uh, there some of them are babes, some of them, you know, they even though they're, you know, they're flowing in the night in the gifts of the spirit and all of that but still when it comes to the word of god they are still babes they are children they cannot be fed solid food okay so we need to be careful we need to understand uh, where people are we need to nurture them build them up in the ways of uh, god look at what uh, john chapter 16 verses 1 4 and 12 say you know jesus also had people written in his heart and in his mind right you know one day when jesus and his disciples were very tired he says let's take the boat quickly and go to a quiet place and rest so they go to in the boat and when they go to the other side what do they see already people have heard the news that jesus is going to come to that side of the shore they all come running and the multitude of people are just waiting there and when jesus sees that he says oh no no we want to get away from these people and rest and these people don't seem to be leaving us does he say that no the bible says when he saw then he was moved with compassion and what does he do he preaches and he teaches them and it becomes evening and the disciples come and say send them away you know others we have to get food for them jesus says you give them food to eat and he said where can we go and get for so many people and then jesus we know multiply the five loaves and two fishes why did he do that because he had people written in his heart and that is why we can see the Holy Spirit moving so um, uh, powerfully. So look at what Jesus says. You know, he says in John chapter 16, these things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. I, I, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now so we see that you know um, jesus was very purposeful in the sermons that he preached um you know um he he taught them things that they needed to know at those times some things that they did not need at that time he he, he did not you know uh share it with them he knew that they will receive revelations later on the same goes with us you know um uh, when we are preaching we need to be mindful of you know our audience, where they are, what is their need? You can ask God; He will show you, and then you can pray the you can preach the appropriate message. Okay, don't preach uh, what your audience wants to hear. Some some people want to hear on mission, some people want to hear on evangelism, some people want to hear on discipleship. But as a pastor, as a leader, you need to hear from the Holy Spirit. You know prepare sermons, topics throughout the year, uh, knowing where your congregation is, knowing where they are, and seeing how God wants you to lead them and um, guide them and prepare them. Not only for adults, but also youth, also with children. You know, we are, we are in the children's ministry, we're writing our own children's church curriculum. All the topics that you're learning in Bible college, we are teaching our children's church. We are written, right, we've written curriculum for various topics. But, uh, you know, we also sometimes we tailor that and see, okay, where are our children now? You know, after the pandemic, we realize all our children are grown and now they've gone to teen church. Those children who were not part of the curriculum before have now joined. So we shouldn't continue from where we left. We need to go back and start from the very beginning. So we need to see and understand and discern and do, uh, you know, see where our audience is, what is their needs, and preach and teach likewise. Oh, no? Okay. The next one is honor everyone. Okay. Um, Romans 12 says, you know, be kind, affectionate. Uh, give in honor give preference to one another okay uh, matthew chapter 10 jesus says who well, gives uh, one of these little ones a cup of cold water in my name surely i say by no means you will lose the reward okay so don't treat people only the rich people the educated the high class well speak to them nicely treat them well and don't you know uh, overlook people who are uh, insignificant, small, um, you know, uh, lower economic strata of society, not well educated, but treat everyone equally and, you know, um, care genuinely for people. You know, people can see through. 
when you are somebody who just pretends to hello praise the lord brother sister and uh, you know all that people can see through you know people can see through when you're genuine and when you're just faking it so genuinely care for people okay the bible word of god teaches us that we need to honor our elders those who are in authority those who teach god's word are double honor look at what first timothy chapter 5 verse 7 says in your books you'll have the the recent publication i have the old one so that is why you are we are on different pages okay um so you know um first timothy chapter 5 verse 7 paul is writing to timothy he says all those who are rulers who elders especially those who teach the word they receive what what should they receive double honor okay and then in first thessalonians 5 he says esteem very highly in love those who are over you in the law that means we respect everyone who are preaching teaching you know some of your pastors you go back you know they don't know anything about computers they have not gone to bible college they don't know about gifts of spirit uh, speaking in tongues and all of those things you don't look down on them you know you don't treat them as they are you know they lost it and all that uh, you still give them the honor the double honor because they are people who are teaching and preaching god's word okay uh, show no partiality paul is writing to young timothy in first timothy chapter 5 he says you know show no partiality and he says you know when uh, if you show you know don't show partiality he says you know who are your witnesses look at that verse who are your witnesses says the lord jesus and the elect angels are your witnesses so even if people are not watching even if i'm not there to come to ephesus and timothy know this that is christ and the angels who are watching over you so do not uh, you know uh, be partial and also in uh, james chapter 2 um, you know um, it says that in the last verse in verse 9 if you show partiality you commit sin sin is not only lying and cheating and murdering and using bad words and adultery sin is also showing partiality okay so don't commit that sin don't show partiality um, treat everyone equally even when it comes to discipline if you have to discipline somebody in your church who is well educated or very rich you might think oh if i discipline this person he might not come to church he might leave my church i will lose all the money um, you know and all of that you know don't bother just discipline um, in in a godly way in the right way in a loving way okay be grateful say thank you okay thank you does not make you feel small uh, thank anyone and everyone whether it's maids people who are the gatekeeper you know driver whoever you know people who are serving just thank them um, because if it's not for them things would not go smoothly and you know it says in god's word that each one of us even though we are individual members, we have different functions in the body of Christ, and each one is used up for the edification, for the building up of the church. Okay, if somebody shares things with you in confidence, please maintain confident confidentiality. Don't go and you know uh, share it with your wife, with your children. Some things you need to just keep it personal. Don't share it with the, the church staff or the elders in the church. Uh, don't also use it as an example you know sometimes we give an example uh, and we explain the scenario because you have to explain it to give that example and people in the church can identify they're always thinking who's this person who's this person who's this person then they will be trying to and the person who's listening to it they will feel very very heartbroken and disappointed so avoid using uh, examples avoid using examples of your wife your children uh, in your messages because you know they will feel that you're letting them down if you want to use some examples get that permission before you you see example and i've heard pastors say i've asked my wife i can i've asked my uh, children if i can use this example they've given me the permission so i'm saying it so that means people are saying, okay, when I go and share with this pastor, he's not going to share my secrets out. So he's a reliable person to share things with, okay? Correct people uh, lovingly, 
you know, uh, First Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14 says, let all that you do, do in, be done in love. Okay, uh, you know, uh, correct people with a good heart, with a good intention, with a good attitude. Uh, two things pastor says when he corrects people is first he warns them. So he calls them, he hears from them, he tries to let them see what they're doing wrong. Uh, he tries to explain things to them. Uh, he shows them how they can, what the steps they need to take to correct it. So just the warning stage. And then he gives them time. You know, to, to make those corrections, to heed the corrections that he has uh, given them. Okay. Then, if they are not going to, you know, uh, heed that warning, then he is going to bring in the, uh, then the second approach, you know, then he brings in the correction. Okay. The correction also, he says, there's a cause and there's an uh, effect. Some corrections are because the person basically doesn't have the skill not able to manage their time uh, is not able to uh, because they have lack of training in that area then pastor is a bring coming in stepping in and he's bringing the corrective measures okay you take some st time off get this training you know have this time management plan all of these things she can help but at sometimes when people you know um, are lazy they are unwilling to work hard there is rebellion there is pride uh, they have conflict with people you know bad attitudes they have selfish agendas they think they're very super spiritual you know very high-minded uh, at those times pastor's correction is very very severe okay because you can help people with time management you can help them if uh, they don't let they lack the skills and all that but these attitude problems uh, is 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 going to be difficult because this is going to actually affect the ministry is going to affect uh, people in the ministry it's setting a bad example to other people it's going to cause a lot of uh, strife division and all of that so to safeguard everything the best thing he does is send these people away or release them from their um, responsibility because basically you can't change an attitude of a person you can help them in their skills in their training time management but not with their um, attitudes and because this cause their cause of rebellion their cause of uh, conflict with people bad attitudes high-mindedness self agendas super spirituality is going to affect other people Okay, in those cases, what pastor does is he releases that people or he sends them away, he, he takes away the uh, responsibility. Okay, but he says when he corrects people, he does it with the right motive, the right mind, so that, you know, he has, uh, his conscience is not pricking against God. Uh, you know, he's not doing anything that God does not want him to uh, do. Okay, um, but this is all about uh, attitudes of people, but when you have a personal it's not talking about personal, uh, uh, you know, uh, relationship attitudes, uh, you know, personal issues that you have with people. Then you have to, you know, talk out your personal conflicts with the person, try to resolve it. If the person is not willing, you can't change that person's will, right? You just let them go. You just pray for them. But you do what is right, okay? Uh, you always correct in private, okay? Don't, even when you correct in private, don't make it known to others. Hey, I sent this person away because this person did this, 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 this. You know, uh, this person is not right. He's not a good leader. He did this. So I removed him from leadership position. Uh, you can just say, you know, this person is no longer going to be a leader. This other person is going to be the leader. Don't give the reasons. Just keep the reasons just to safeguard the person, just to show that person, hey, we love you. What you're doing is wrong, but we still love you. We don't want to put you down. Uh, so the person will feel, you know, uh, the freedom to still come back to church, still be part of fellowship, uh, still serve Christ. But if you correct in public, you know what's going to happen? It's going to hurt that person. That person can even leave church, uh, leave even the family of God, have nothing to do with Christ and become a rebel. And, you know, things have worked out in the um negative okay uh, and when you applaud people applaud them in public uh, just don't take names just say uh, you know want to thank everybody everyone who did uh, you know 
worked hard for this crusade, for this event, for this program. Thank you, everyone. Let's give them a big clap. Okay. So just applaud everyone in um, public. Okay. Some simple things that we can keep in mind. Um, you know, um, have a personal strategy for handling uh, difficult situations. Most of the time, pastor says, when he is um, uh, when he wants to correct somebody, if it's a minor issue and little things, he just sends an email. Okay. Uh, if it's something little more uh, which can be spoken of, he does it over the phone. But when it's a major issue, difficult issue, some things that he needs to really speak, get an understanding, he call, has a meeting with the person. Calls a person for a meeting, meets, hears that person, he keeps on listening, listening, listening. While he's listening to the person, he's also listening to what God is telling him. And then he communicates a decision to the person. Why not communicate, um, you know, decisions that you make um, uh, through email, important decisions through email and phone, because sometimes when we are writing, people with their emotions can read your email with their emotions. Okay. And then that can become, uh, you know, can become very tragic. So if you want to just correct somebody, just uh, very simple, you can just say, you know, I think you could do this in this way. This would be nice. And just giving you a suggestion. Fine. Some important things, important to call the person and uh, speak to them. I've also learned from my mistakes. Sometimes I've just sent email and the person has read it. Uh, I send it to a group, but the person has taken it very personally, has read it with their own emotions, the email I sent, or my WhatsApp message, and it has happened. Uh, it has a negative uh, impact. So better to talk personally face to face so that the person is able to see your reaction, your heart attitude, what you're trying to say, your tone of voice, and are able to understand you. Okay. Don't be a boss over God's people. God's word clearly tells us that, you know, um, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 and 4, Peter says, shepherd the flock of God, serving as overseers, not with compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, and not being lord over those entrusted to you. Okay, so don't lord over uh, the people of God. Be examples, be a shepherd by setting an um, example. Okay, many times, uh, you know, shepherds have misused people, uh, you know, they have uh, abused people uh, to serve their own purposes. And it's very sad to hear uh, what, uh, you know, pastors do. You know, some pastors, they will walk in front, they will have one man holding their Bible or their briefcase coming behind them. Uh, you know, they're going up to the pulpit or to the podium. They have the man carrying a Bible or briefcase. I'm sure you have your two hands. You can carry your Bible or your briefcase. Once I was very shocked to see in one church in our own city, um, uh, you know, man, a man of God, uh, his son wanted to go to the restroom. And so there was another man following him. He's a grown-up boy, not even a girl. He's a grown-up boy, but like a bodyguard, you know, man's running behind him. It's a very sad thing to see. So this is basically misusing uh, people. We're not to misuse people. We're not to lord over their lives. We're here to set a godly example uh, and to build them up in Christ likeness and serve people in Christ likeness. That's what Christ did, right? He did not come to be served, but to serve. All of you with me? Okay, last point. Do not control. Do not manipulate uh, people. Uh, sometimes, you know, um, uh, you know, when people go to other Bible studies, they go to other crusades, other uh, meetings held by other pastors. The pastor comes to know he he just sends out threats from the pulpit, you know, um, and he um, he starts saying how you know uh, how he's so spiritual, how he's so anointed. He uses different testimonies and different uh, things to just show how anointed and how powerful he is compared to the other men of God in the city. Sometimes you can use a pulpit even to say, you know, in that church, they're speaking wrong doctrines, teaching wrong doctrines, so don't go there. Um, you know, um, but as a, as a, as a uh, minister of God, we need to give people freedom. You know, if they want to go to another Bible study group and they're learning from there, let them go. If they want to go to another prayer group and they're learning how to pray and then they're being built up, let them go. 
you know, if they're going to another church where they're having a uh, an event where they've organized a, on some specific topic from the Bible or something related to life and ministry, let them go. Don't stop them. Let them learn from other ministers and men and women of um, um, of God. Uh, don't be worried whether they'll come back to your church. Now, if they belong to your church, you know, if they are your family, they will come back home, right? Even if your children or your spouse, if you have a fight with your spouse, you go away to office and uh, in the night, do you go and stay away somewhere else? No, you come back to your family, even though you don't talk to each other, don't look at each other, you come back home. You might have shouted at your children, but the children don't tell the school teacher, I, do, I love you more than my mommy, I'm not going to go back to school. I'm not going to go back home. I want to stay here in the school. No, we don't do that. So, you know, um, people, you know, you feed them, you train them, you shepherd them, you know, they will always come back where they belong. They will always come back where their family is. So don't threaten people, don't manipulate them, don't control them. Yes, Anand. As a spiritual father, you protect all of your sheep from wrong teaching by just telling them from the word of God what is right, what is wrong. Don't tell them that man of God, that church, that pastor, this son, we don't put down anyone. If you hear anyone in the city who's teaching something wrong, don't specifically tell them, you know, in that church, you know, this is all the wrong teaching. People are very curious. They'll go there and listen, you know. So, you know, then finally they will, you know, it's so deceptive. They can easily get attached there. So what you need to do is uh, you need to be very smart. You teach those wrong doctrines from the word of God. Teach them what is the truth. So that when they are faced with the wrong doctrines, you they know what they have been taught and they will make a choice themselves. Okay. Yes, uh, Sean's question and then we'll stop because you're already running out of time. Okay, can we take your question next week, uh, Sean? Okay, we'll take your question. Thank you, everyone, for joining class. Uh, I'll see you next week. Thank you.